Hello everyone, welcome to this book discussion on Mapping Scientific Method, Disciplinary Narrations, edited by Geeta Chadda and Renny Thomas, which has been also published by Rutledge in 2022. Today we have with us both the editors and the series editor, Professor Sundar Sarukai. Sundar Sarukai is a founder of the Barefoot Philosophers Initiative and he works primarily in the realm of philosophy of natural and social sciences. He is an editorial advisory board member of the Leonardo book series on science and art published by MIT Press and the series editor for science and technology studies, Rutledge. He's the author of the following books, Translating the World, Science and Language, Philosophy of Symmetry, Indian Philosophy and Philosophy of Science, What is Science and the Cracked Mirror, an Indian Debate on Experience and Theory, co-authored with Gopal Guru. Geeta Chadda teaches sociology in University of Mumbai. Her areas of academic interest include sociological theory, feminist science studies, sociology of knowledge, intersectional feminist epistemologies, and visual culture. She has designed and taught the first feminist science studies course in India at the uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, TISS Mumbai. She has developed frameworks for feminist archiving at the Research Center for Women's Studies, SNDT Women's University, and has designed interdisciplinary pedagogic initiatives for integrating science and social science teaching. She is the co-editor of Reimagining Sociology in India, Feminist Perspectives, Ratlitch 2018, and also of Mapping Scientific Method, Disciplinary Narrations, Ratlitch 2022. Rennie Thomas is an assistant professor of sociology and social anthropology at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, ISCR, Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. He has been a Charles Wallace Fellow in Social Anthropology at Queen's University, Belfast, Northern Ireland, UK, and a visiting fellow at the Department of Cultural Anthropology and Cultural History at Frederick Scheller University, Jena, Germany. He's the author of Science and Religion in India, Beyond Disenchantment, Rutledge 2021 and co-editor of Mapping Scientific Method, Disciplinary Narrations, Rutledge 2022. Thomas is currently working in India, drawing materials from fieldwork and archival work. He is currently the book reviews co-editor of Contributions to Indian Sociology, Sage Publications. I welcome all three of you to the conversation. And let me begin by taking this opportunity to ask the series editor, Professor Sarukai, a question about how the series began and with what kind of objective. Um, thank you, Rituparno. It's a great pleasure to be here with uh, our two editors, uh, Geeta and Reni, and to share a few thoughts about the series. Uh, we are delighted that we, are being, uh, we were able to produce this volume, Mapping Scientific Method, due to the very intense and diligent work by Geeta and Remy in bringing together a wonderful set of people who have actually contributed many thoughtful pieces to rethinking some fundamental questions about the different disciplines in the natural and social sciences. So I was very uh, particularly happy that we could place this within the series or within the series editor called uh, Science and Technology Studies. And, um, you know, there are, science and technology studies, as many of us know, is actually a very vast field. There are separate institutes which work on science and technology studies, which in some, in a very large sense, integrate history, sociology and philosophy of science and various other new kinds of interdisciplinary perspectives on science. But unfortunately, um, in India, it's been very difficult to establish a meaningful STS program. I mean, for I've seen, known for over two decades the number of students who are interested in actually seriously pursuing a study of, uh, you know, analyzing science, science practices, science institutions, the epistemology of science and so on. But the kind of institutional support which is needed for doing this has been completely lacking and for a variety of reasons. And that is part of the sociology of STS in India. We have to understand why it has been so difficult to establish uh, 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 so, you know, a very good or many good uh, master's programs in STS, like in many other universities all over the world, or to produce very uh, collaborative, rich, you know, um, rich network group of projects or research work on STS across the country. Uh, while I won't get into many of the reasons for that, for the particular problem in India, um, I felt that one of the more meaningful ways to do this is to establish 
a kind of a, a, kind, a book series in which we will be able to look at STS in a slightly different manner. So, um, so one of the reasons I think for starting the series is first of course, to try and bring questions of STS into the Indian academic media, the domain where opening, open out this very rich discipline to our students and faculty in the hope that we can catalyze new ways of thinking about uh, what sciences mean. And by sciences, I include both the natural and the social sciences. And that's part of the thing. And the second part of it was uh, trying, um, you know, there are many STS uh, series around the world. As we know, because of its growing popularity, there's a la large number of books that are published under which largely fall under STS. So what would it mean to start at another series, uh, something which is located in India, which is, uh, and that, that, that's a, that raises a very important, uh, larger sociological problem about STS itself. It is that, uh, the problem is that, you know, the mainstream, the dominant community of STS has drawn very little from um, scholars in India and largely from Asia and Africa. It's still a very white centric, uh, dominated by, you know, specific groups within um, US and UK and Germany and so on. So uh, that's been a sense of great frustration for me. Why? Because, you know, part of the problem of our understanding of science, the way science is understood within India, both in terms of its research practices as also in education, we should remember that the idea of science is so in deeply influential, both nationally and culturally, that it impacts the ideas of education right from childhood in Indian schools. So <clears throat> given that, my question was, um, you know, how would we be able to place this question of STS doing two things? One, in its Asian and African context, from its invisible position and to a kind of a, a not a well maybe a kind of a resistance or maybe a kind of a hope that work from here on perspectives on doing science and the many unique perspectives on science and technology coming from these areas from the experiences of these societies the hope was whether that would wake the global sts community up when are they going to get up, wake up and say, look, China and India are one of the largest consumers of technologies. They are, you know, every time they build some digital technology like the mobile phone, they say, China and India, are, you know, we are the world's largest um, consumers of it. And nothing, almost nothing of what we write and think about uh, science and technology ever becomes part of the STS. And there's something which I've written earlier in the review of the handbook of STS, uh, the last volume, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a review of it in current science and it was shocking to me because that particular handbook begins by noting that the editors went out of their way to be diverse when they wanted to get diverse representatives from these non-white Western societies. And what they ended up after that effort was a pretend, I'm less than, you know, if I remember right, it's been some time, maybe about five or seven percent of authors from who are not belonging to these mainstream systems. So how does one engage in this question? So uh, those were some of the important reasons why we wanted to start uh, STS series, uh, located in some sense within the Asian and African contexts. Right, uh, thank you, Professor Sarfai. Uh, you know, just to take from what you uh, just mentioned, uh, you know, our question would be then, uh, how have uh, non-Western worldviews sort of impacted or influenced S science and technology both and STS as well? Uh, well, if you look at STS as a discipline, as a well-established discipline, as I said, very well represented, for example, with the handbooks uh, published by the Forest uh, Group, um, you know, you have, for, for, you know, there are many uh, such volumes of the handbooks. If you ask me, have we impacted I would say no, you know, um, there are being very stray references to certain kinds of, um, you know, some dominant work from India in some sense, but it's uh, never been, um, you know, something which people have been able to integrate into mainstream STS. What do I mean by mainstream STS? What I mean is that are, or is the work done in Asian African context? ever taught within mainstream STS programs 
to non-Asians and Africans. That is, if there is a very established SDS program, let's say in the US, how have they been able to draw upon the work being produced in India and elsewhere into their teaching of their students and not ghettoizing it as saying, oh, let's look at Indian science in a particular manner, right? So we look at that as the parameter, just like we read the work produced for these American students, for our students, right? So if you look at this, uh, this parameter, I don't think STF had any great influence on the larger STS community at all. But then, the, then I think the, you know it's upon us. Other than the usual disclaimers about um, you know um, kinds of colonialism and prejudices and so on. I mean, if you keep that aside, I mean it's difficult to keep that aside because that's always there, I guess. Um, but if you keep it aside, then we have to find uh, more and more meaningful, creative, rigorous ways of producing analysis of STS which will then make people pay attention to us. I mean, I've been looking for the example when I did my new book on democracy called Social Life of Democracy, I have a section there on science and truth and the idea of democracy. And there's been a lot of work in STS on science and democracy. But on one thing, you know, hey, here is this country which everybody calls as the world's largest democracy. There have been many exciting experiments on democracy in India and very exciting cultural responses to the idea of science itself in very, very unique ways in the Indian context. Yet, you go look at, um, you know, all the literature on science and democracy, which is such a big, um, you know, uh, fund, fund, funding project in many places. Uh, you find very, very little reference. It's almost as if none of us exist in this world within the STS. So I think these are the kinds of questions we need to keep raising. And hopefully the series for me was one way of, um, it's not just about the impact of, I'm, you know, frankly, I'm not invested in saying, you know, Indian or Asian African, you should become part of mainstream. I mean, I, it, it's not promoting this particular, for me, it's about promoting different viewpoints. That is, the, the problem is if you have a universal view of science, uh, it, 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 um, it, it actually lends to a great sense of hegemony and power about the way science is understood, about the impact of science on Indian societies and so on. So to me, the question is, how are we going to be able to understand this hegemonic impulse? of SNT around on various societies, one of the ways is to open up the space of discourse, open up multiple narratives about how we can make sense of the idea of science in order that we can make sense of it based on the context in which we live. Great. Uh, so Professor Sarkar, your chapter in this volume uh, looks at the discipline of philosophy. Uh, you write that philosophy's inquiry on method is self-reflexive. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, this goes back to the question which um, uh, very often we, um, you know, very often when uh, UGC asked, we just, you know, uh, introduce this idea of research method. Yeah, the question about uh, <clears throat> method is actually been something which has become very prominent in Indian academics in recent times. <clears throat> you know, we have had um, almost all courses having to teach research method, particularly in the social sciences. And one of the comments which I often used to hear from science students and science teachers was that, uh, you know, we never teach something called method for our students. And in fact, when I have taught, you know, many of the courses I end up teaching are interdisciplinary where students from both science and social science said, and because of this new rule on uh, teaching research method, typically the science students are uh, puzzled. They say, well, we have never been taught something like this. What are you, what are you going to teach us about scientific method or whatever you call as research method, right? So there is a larger question about what method itself is. And if you look at the practice of science, um, method is internalized in various ways if you want to pull out this idea of method in it. But, you know, even as a science student, um, I never, even till my PhD, um, I didn't, I mean, I never did a course called method, uh, even for my PhD program, uh, within the sciences, right? So, 
this question of method, I think, uh, carries a great burden on the social sciences much more than on the sciences. It seems to suggest that somehow the idea of method is needed to regulate the social science in some sense, while that is internal to the very act of doing science. You know, and that therefore there is a sudden the social science by itself is not methodical in some sense. And that you need an explicit awareness of it in order to give that structure to it. Um, for example, even in mathematics, you don't teach a course called mathematics method. So you just teach the different disciplines of mathematics. Now, I think there's a lot we have to do in particular problem in this kind of an emphasis and the push to the idea of research methods and methods in general and the whole discourse on the idea of methods. And to me, in philosophy too, there has always been a particular kind of um, question for me in the sense that many of the questions in on the idea of scientific method came not from science as much as it came from philosophy of science. It was philosophers who had began to raise the question of, you know, for example, the problem of demarcations of science, what distinguishes one type of science from another, etc. And what distinguishes science in the whole Popperian model, for example, from astrology, for example, is to show that there's something intrinsic to the function and the structure of science, which is presumably captured by science, the, an idea of scientific method. But we also know that um, again, from philosophy of science, and this, uh, the idea of scientific method itself is very contentious. Therefore, first of all, there is no one scientific method. There is no unified scientific method as such, because science itself is very dispersed. There are many, many different kinds of disciplines within it. Although you have a general idea of, you know, some systematic knowledge of empirical. Uh, phenomena, for example, would be one quick way to summarize what science is, it still doesn't capture what the unique ideas of method which are possibly present in science. So when I meant that uh, the question of method was self-reflexive for philosophy, what I was trying to say is that uh, the question of method is actually driven by a question of, um, you know, philosophers ask, asking this question of science, for example, right? And when philosophers often ask this question, they're also asking the question, not just of what is method in science, but they're always asking this larger question, what is method actually? Is it even possible to conceptualize the meaning of a method? Is it just a series of steps? Is it something to do with the logical connection? Should that, so remember that the early philosophy of science argument is that the empirical world and the theoretical world have to be somehow connected logically. It's not just saying there is a method, which is a kind of a connection. So it is not just different steps, but steps which are related in some notion of logic. So you have to unpack what logic is and that idea of unpacking logic from philosophy. Right, because it's uh, logic as uh, uh, some uh, branch of philosophy and so on. So, to me, in my own approach to understanding the question of method in different disciplines and particularly in the sciences, I always um, stumble upon the fact that every time we talk about the possibilities of different methods, etc., we are always going back and asking the question: Hold on, what do I mean by method? How do I first conceptualize the idea of method before I begin to talk about what method is and so on? And so, in that sense, I think. A lot of philosophy, philosophy of X, philosophy of anything, philosophy of social sciences, of arts, language, etc., uh, by, by definition has got this uh, intrinsic capacity for self reflexivity. You know, always stopping yourself by asking the question and making sure that you know what you're asking and that you know the grounds upon which you can phrase that question. You know, and that then, uh, in that sense, to me, allows me to, you know, that's the reason why I uh, use the idea that. It's self-reflective activity. The very idea of uh, the, the concept of method when I approach it from the rubric of philosophy. Well, thank you so much, Professor Sarukai, for explaining that. And I think it gives us a good foundation to now address our questions to the two co-editors. So thank yeah. you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye. So. Uh, we would want to know from you about, of course, the origin and the genesis of the book. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I'll, uh, firstly, let me thank you, Ritpurna and Dipali, and doing sociology for hosting this discussion. 
it's been a very difficult volume and we also want to take this opportunity to thank Sundar, uh, the series editor of the volume and Rattledge also. Uh, now, uh, you know, most academic volumes very often, I mean, they come out of uh, seminars and conferences where there've been, there's been a convivium of uh, voices, people coming together. Uh, this one uh, was different because it didn't really happen like that. It started off with uh, an idea, a conversation between Renia and I uh, uh, quite a few years ago. Renia, how many years back was it? I think uh, six, seven years back, right? 2017, actually. Yeah, yeah. We were thinking basically of starting uh, to work together on something in science, uh, critical science studies. And... Um, you know, I think I was, for example, uh, carrying my experience with being enrolled in the science wars in the late 90s and, uh, you know, where we were uh, involved in this big fight uh, of, uh, you know, asking for uh, credibility as social scientists and people in the humanities, uh, which are, uh, uh, you know, not given very easily in the academia. And uh, with the so-called hoax of the late 90s, it had become a very polemical uh, uh, environment uh, for us, particularly those in science studies. So, um, you know, we I was involved in that kind of a polemical uh, uh, conversation. On the other hand, in my own work, I was looking at substantive issues about exploring the creative process in science, how does it get done? I was also beginning to look at feminist questions in science, but um, I, 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 lurking behind and at the foundational level was this question about the scientific method, because, you know, we were talking about epistemological and ontological uh, questions uh, about the method of science from very different locations. So I was strongly feeling the need to bring uh, them together at the level, you know, because in philosophy of science, there's this whole uh, there's this whole idea of the unity of method that sort of combines all modern academic disciplines. And this method happens to be the scientific method. But we were experiencing diversity of method, not only in our own disciplines, but in the larger academia, trying to see how the method in natural science was probably very different in the silo of natural science itself, the way physics would articulate and use the scientific method and the way biology would be, would be very different. And there is that hierarchy of sciences within the silos, which would say that physics is a more exact, more harder science, whereas biology is a softer one. In our own silo of the social sciences, we experience the same things, that economics is uh, you know, much more considered to be harder and more uh, exact, in fact, psychology is experimental method, whereas sociology is much like biology, you know, sociology and anthropology as considered to be the soft disciplines. So with these experiences, I think we were basically trying to look at the question of knowledge production, but, um, uh, and there was a lot of writing already on the theory ladenness of knowledge. You know, the fact that, uh, no, and, and that was something that most people within the social sciences were beginning to had were beginning to accept. But I think underlying the question uh, of theory also was the question of methodology and method. So I think we were trying to explore that foundational question. I think uh, that's the kind of thinking that went in, in the making of this, beginning of this volume. Yeah, I mean, there isn't a particular, you know, moment to really think about this uh, volume. But I think in 2017, you know, the, the famous March for Science happened. And, uh, you know, Sundar had written a piece and then some of us responded. And of course, you know, Gida had already done, you know, that uh, science was debate in the 90s. So it is at that point of time, actually, Sundar had invited us to really do this volume. That's actually one of the important moments because, you know, we realized that actually, if you look at all the debates, uh, the key question is always about the idea of method. But we re really don't have anything to really talk about the method, whether it is in social sciences or humanities, and especially having, you know, people coming from all the disciplines. So also because of that reason, it became a very challenging volume, as Gida has already mentioned, because 
it's not an easy task to really have you know practitioners from all the disciplines to come together to ask one question which is what is scientific method so that's the origin in many ways right uh so again to both of you uh this you know this book is about uh methods uh what role do methods play in scientific disciplines if you could throw some light on that you know i think um method plays a role in every i mean all all uh, knowledge uh, even our everyday knowledge is right so it's a question of um, how do we uh, select um, a question to investigate how do we um, collect information and material around that question how do we uh, then explain that yeah how do we then present that so the question of method is uh, central to, uh, I guess, all, all, all thought in that sense, yeah. And in the academic disciplines, uh, as we were arguing, saying that the need to study method is because it is not spoken about. In that sense, it's almost sort of taken for granted. You know, even if you see uh, the Pali and Rituprana in our own discipline, you probably, or in, actually you see a lot more of that in the social sciences, that you teach the content, you teach the theory, you give the, you know, final end product, but you do not necessarily unpack the question of method. That how did you produce this theory? Uh, how did you acquire this material? You know, so in that sense, uh, uh, I think that our idea of method relatedness is to say that in all knowledge production, the central um, question to be asked is what are the uh, ontological assumptions that you're making about the field that you're studying, what are the epistemological devices that you're using to justify your knowledge claims, and these are uh, what make methodological principles. So uh, I think it's like uh, it gives us a it, it gives us a sort of a, 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 you know a skeleton, a framework, a blueprint to look at knowledge production and how we produce our own. It, it's like a guide, you know. I mean, it's like a a tool in that sense. I mean, it's more than a tool, but it's like a map that we have. So yeah, in all, I would say in all thought, there is method and in each discipline in the academia, there is method, but very differently uh, uh, understood. Uh, Renny, would you like to- what, what, Renny, how would you, how, how do you uh, look at that? Yeah, I mean, that's the point, actually. So also, I think like one of the, you know, initial idea that we had, you know, it, is to really look at how, you know, identity really, how some, how some of these disciplines create identities through methods, like as Sundar has just mentioned, you know, so method becomes very significant for uh, any disciplines to have a separate identity, a unique identity. And uh, actually, by studying methods, we're also looking at the very institutionalization of these disciplines. So where identity becomes a key argue, a key term, right? Because you know, how do we know that a particular discipline is more scientific or not is then based on the kind of methods that they have. So that's why if all the chapters, in fact, look at these questions in a very interesting manner. I think, uh, you know, again, uh... If you could also maybe elaborate for our uh, viewers a little bit more on what do you uh, mean when you say uh, method ladenness of knowledge. Uh, so if you could talk about that. That uh, anybody who's done, uh, you know, research uh, would know that, uh, uh, you know, any truth claim that we produce any understanding or any uh, theory that we put out is dependent on our methods. So if, for example, in sociology, you decide to use a positivist method, uh, and this is a classic debate in our own discipline, right? That uh, when you take a more positivist approach to say, uh, an, an, an phenomenon, like suicide, as the kind did, uh, you would come up with a certain kind of an analysis and you would then produce a certain kind of a theory. Yeah. His ontological assumptions were to look at 
uh, social facts and to constitute social facts. And his entire uh, oeuvre was to try to uh, you know, define what can be considered as a social fact, right? And um, on the other hand, if you use a more interpretivist argument or you use a more interpretivist method, you go uh, further into the subjectivities of uh, how is suicide classified, who classifies it, right? Uh, you start looking at the same picture differently. Yeah, so this whole idea that uh, uh, the picture changes according to the method that you use uh, or tells you something else, uh, uh, the, the, the method that you use tells you something else about the picture is what primarily we are talking about, the method ladenness of knowledge. Yeah, so at a very simple level, you know, when we work with our classrooms, yeah, so there's constant pressure to do use the survey method yeah and uh, all our students think that you know now particularly uh, post the google form that i can get uh, you know administer 100 150 google forms and then the data is there and it's all plotted and i present it to you and i've got the truth of it yeah and the moment you click it a little bit and say yeah but look beyond or look within and they don't know what to look for then you say look for subjectivities look for experiences look for narratives look for meanings look for values we'll come up with a different picture right so in that sense in a very simple way i think knowledge is uh, deeply deeply method laden as much as it is theory laden Yeah, I mean, uh, it's Gita has already, you know, discussed in detail, actually. So, you know, if you look at any disciplines, like whether it is sociology or uh, physics, for that matter, Stephen Shapin, you know, discusses in a very interesting manner how the notion of hard science and soft science as ideas emerged. And uh, he looks at actually the very history of methods in some of these disciplines to show that this is how a discipline is hard and how a discipline is soft. Depends on the kind of method that they have. And as Geda has very clearly mentioned, the classroom, right? This is a key question that we always get, you know, when we teach research methods, right? You know, we have basically the first session is actually qualitative, then quantitative. And students always ask this question, but what is the difference, right? So I think this is basically a key question in, you know, all the social sciences for sure. But as Sundar was mentioning very interestingly that it is, it doesn't, it's not there in actually the training of sciences, actually, for, the, for example, right? But it is not just in sciences. I, I doubt even in literature, they have a course in uh, methods because, uh, so we recently started teaching a course in methods, which is for uh, humanities and social sciences. But most of the literature students never had actually any course in methods. So it is a very difficult task for even a faculty member of literature to really think about what is a method in literature. And this is again a question that Sharmila Sriyumar addresses in, in the book. Yeah, I think so in the university that I teach, uh, that's one of the bone of contentions that sociology students have a USP because we do methods very systematically and not everyone else does it. So I do tell my students that do this paper very well because it's your USP. Uh, so, Renny, let me start by asking you then the next question that uh, what exactly do you mean by the scientific method and uh, what is the need to study methods and a book for it? Hmm. Okay, so scientific method, as Sundar has already discussed in detail, right, you know, it goes back to the history of uh, philosophy, especially and uh, philosophy of sciences discipline that discussed in detail, you know, what is a scientific method. But actually, when it comes to uh, the question of method in disciplines such as sociology and other, other social science discipline, uh, one of our, uh, you know, initial arguments about this volume was, why do we need to study methods? Why do we need to study methods itself, right? And it's interesting that if you look at even the debates on scientific method, there isn't one scientific method, right? So we are, we thought that it is therefore important to really look at the multiple histories of the idea of scientific method itself. So it is therefore not scientific method, but scientific methods. And then you can see very clearly how 
you know, practitioners from different scientific disciplines uh, are talking about scientific method in a different manner in the volume, right? We have a physicist, a mathematician, a chemist, and a biologist. But if you actually read their articles, right, you know, there isn't much in common because they are, all of them are talking about different forms of scientific method. So one way is to really look at uh, certain forms of histories of this idea of scientific method. Second is to actually challenge the idea of, uh, you know, a homogeneous notion of scientific method. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, also, you know, I mean, I think uh, 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 there is also this uh, uh, common understanding among scientists, for example, saying that, uh, you know, our method is really what we do. Our method is something that, uh, you know, we don't uh, uh, structure it, overstructure it. The, the idea of the scientific method is a problem with the philosopher of science. You know, so this whole idea that there is an hypothetical deductive method, that there is induction, there is deduction, there's, you know, and that there is uh, an assumption we are making about the nature of the world uh, and about uh, uh, knowledge also, you know, that it is empirically driven. Um, a lot of the common scientists will tell you that, you know, these are really not our concerns, right? What our concern is what we do in the laboratory what we do in 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 the in the tech in the books that we uh, work uh, our equations on that's what is the method so we don't work with the in fact ferevan himself says that the philosopher saying that science actually doesn't work with method it actually works against method in many ways that if it is you, you break the method that you really actually uh, find uh, uh, ways, newer ways of thinking. Or uh, So this question of method as it is understood, say, in the sciences also is very, very interesting. Though the idea of the scientific method in modernity has been so dominant that it has sort of pervaded into all academic disciplines. No? As Rene was saying, that it's something almost becoming an identity of a discipline. How scientific are you? Right? So in that in that kind of a, a, a race, what we wanted to also bring in was this. So very often, any attempt to reason, any attempt to rationality is almost equated with the scientific method, whereas actually that is something that we should really challenge and question. Yeah. So therefore, I think the study of method is very crucial in our context. And that's why I thought we thought that you know a book would be an, a, just a small beginning in that direction. And as Reni was saying, it is extremely difficult to find people to write uh, uh, for the volume, you know, write in the way that we wanted to. We were trying to map the trajectory of the scientific disciplines, uh, a scientific method in each discipline, that each discipline meets um, or uh, comes up with the discontents with the scientific method uh, by its own internal history or growth or logic. Yeah, so uh, we were trying to see what, how does the scientific method get opened up, you know, pluralized, uh, diversified, say, in a, in, a, in a discipline like physics, uh, you know, in a post-quantum mechanics area, era. So how does that happen? How does anthropology actually articulate its own uh, uh, its own uh, questions about scientificity of its own discipline. How does uh, psychology question, for example, Sabha's excellent essay in the volume is about questioning what the experimental method and the limitations of some of the uh, methods in that psychology are scientific methods. So, so uh, we have, we basically, it was an attempt, a very exploratory attempt to look at how scientific method, what is the trajectory in each of these disciplines, so that we can get a sense of what, how to further uh, the critique, you know, uh, the critique, uh, and the critique which is intended to actually reclaim it. So when in our brief that we were talking with our authors and contributors, we were trying to say, let's look at how the scientific method first got established within the discipline in modernity, uh, in your particular discipline, how did it progress? How did it meet, meet, meet its own uh, uh, challenges? How, how was it challenged and questioned? And then perhaps how it was reclaimed, yeah? So through looking through the whole modernist and postmodernist sort of uh, journey, that was the intention. 
and also actually by you know by looking at the very idea of scientific method we were also trying to understand the existence of say scientism you know in many of these disciplines including sciences so it's not just about social sciences but the existence of scientism in sciences and the phenomenon of scientification that happens very often in the discipline like for example if you look at two examples that we discuss in the book especially from the disciplines of uh, psychology and economics right so very very often you find universities offering MSc in uh, economics or MSc in psychology because this is in many ways an attempt to really scientify these disciplines to get more validity and credibility. So that is also another attempt I thought of adding to that. What Gida just mentioned. Yeah, the quantifiable, you know, whether it's the experimental method or it's a statistical method, this, uh, you know, these are or you know social wherever you the more you quantify the more you are scientific. And whereas this has been questioned in the sciences also. So that was the thing that we were trying to work with. Right. Uh, since both of you are sociologists and you know sociology as a discipline since its origin uh, has had uh, debates on what is what should the method of sociological inquiry be uh, if you go back to writings of Comte. So if both of you could talk about uh, why these uh, issues were so important when uh, you know, the discipline emerged and uh, uh, even now why this question is so important. Penny, you want to go first? Should I? Should I? Okay. All right, all right. So, uh, no, Dipali, I think that's a very important question for us as sociologists because um, the status of science in sociology is actually very uh, uh, complicated, no? As we know, the sociology of science uh, just assumed that science as an institution of modernity is, I mean, is central to the idea of progress and development and uh, modernity, basically. And that um, we need to understand science as a social institution, but we need, we should not, we, we did not uh, question. It had a sort of a privileged position. Why? Because we were ourselves, um, uh, uh, you know, aspiring to occupy uh, the, the place of being a science, right? And um, uh, the sociology of knowledge, on the other hand, also privileged uh, uh, science till probably the 70s with the strong program coming in, or probably even earlier with Kuhn. Um, you know, where sociology of knowledge would also give a clean chit, as we know in the work of Karl Mannheim and others, to saying that it is a special case of uh, knowledge. It's not equal to say, for example, the knowledge claims of uh, religious groups, uh, uh, institutionalized religions, indigenous communities, um, political uh, uh, groups and ideologies, that their ideas of truth are belief and scientific ideas of truth are actually the truth. So in that sense, uh, we were probably not open to critiquing uh, the question of science, because we ourselves are placing ourselves uh, within that uh, domain. And in that sense, probably till the, uh, till the strong program came up, we were not really uh, um, willing. And as I said earlier, the debate existed that if you really look at the, the so-called two sociologies of positivism and interpretivism, the idea of what is a science was uh, being discussed. And therefore, what is sociology was being discussed. The Kindness Positivism and the Weber's Interpretivism gave us two very different ideas of what is science and what is sociology. And so when Weber talks about sociology as being a social science, which is very different from, according to him, being a uh, natural science, whereas a natural physical science is aiming for explanation, we were trying to go in further deeper for understanding. Yeah, of subjectivities. But we were doing it according to Weber, we have to do it in a value neutral way. So we are therefore objective. So this debate existed in the inception of the discipline, whether what is science and whether we are a science or we are not a science. Yeah. And therefore, I think we probably as social in, within sociology, we could uh, uh, you know sort of go back into our origins 
and try and see whether we can rethink this um, uh, you know, very solid and non-porous positivism that uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, extended itself in the uh, middle of the growth of the discipline, yeah. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, I think uh, sociology is, is, in, is an interesting case and that is why both Rene and I found that it was very important for us also as sociologists to uh, think through, through this question about what is, uh, 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 what is science and what is sociology. Uh, and and, and I, I just want to sort of say a little bit about, for example, uh, the thing that I know we all love teaching in class, for example, is the sociological imagination. Yeah. And, and, and the word imagination is often reserved for everything to do with the you know, humanity silos, literature, right? So I enjoy teaching this to my students, the, what is a sociological imagination along with our impulse to be quote unquote objective and scientific, yeah? So bringing these two together, I think we have a rich discipline uh, in which we could explore this. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting that all of us are practitioners of sociology, though we are here to talk about it, um, you know, only which is not necessarily about sociology, but it is also about sociology in many ways, actually. But of course, you know, the very history of sociology in many ways has to do with methods, right? So, you know, if we go back to Durkheim also, right, I mean, the idea in rules of sociological method, and the idea that you know one has to create a new method so that there can be a new independent discipline. So in many ways, sociology as a discipline emerged with the, of course, coming of new methods, right? So that sociology is different from the existing, uh, whatever you know, non-scientific social sciences or whatever, right? So, but it's interesting that I was thinking about thinking actually what um, Gita had just mentioned, right? So on the one hand, we have the science of society. So the first year itself we teach at the undergraduate level is sociology science or not. So we, again, our obsession with science and method is very clearly there. But we don't really teach actually anything on science in sociology, right? So if you look at actually the case of India, right? I mean, you know, a person can actually finish an undergraduation and master's without really doing any course on science. Even though we have produced some very important scholarship, uh, on sociology of science in India, but we don't really teach. Actually, it's not a compulsory course in any of the universities, any of the sociology department, for example. In D school, I think there's a course called sociology of science, which is an elective course, but not a compulsory course. In JNU also, it's an elective course. In Bombay also, I think it is the same. I'm not very sure. So I think it's interesting that on the one hand, there is an obsession with the notion of method, scientific method and science, and there is a certain sense of fear also about science. And that is also one aspect that we are trying to explore in the audience. Why is it that we don't really engage with the question of science? And I think Kamala Ganesh's chapter is clearly addressing this question actually about, you know, where do you place, for example, anthropology and sociology as a discipline between sciences and social science. And Yasmin Arif then takes it uh, in a, at a different level to look at the very idea of social in sociology anthropology. I think the question is also very interesting in the Indian context because of the sociology anthropology thing, right? Because we are not really making a clear cut uh, distinction between sociology and anthropology, unlike the European or North American uh, setup. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, I think since you asked the question of the relevance today, today, as we look at it, while this debate exists in the grammar of our discipline, you know, uh, between uh, the two sociologies, so to speak. Today, it stands completely uh, uh, contested and changed, right? With, with standpoint theory, standpoint methodology coming in, uh, the question of reflexivity coming in, the question of intersectionality in knowledge production coming in. With all these questions coming in, the, question, uh, the, the um, challenges of speaking about uh, sociological methods uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is quite intense in that sense. Um, some of the articles, for example, Nita's article in Nita Pillai's article in on economics, for example, in the volume also looks at what a feminist understanding of economics can actually enhance the discipline. So, you know, we were trying also to do that. We were trying to see how you need to occupy your discipline and move out of it and then come back to it. 
you know, so Sashish talks about this also. So it's very interesting how uh, some NSA like Nita's, for example, is talk, talking about how a feminist economics can actually change the way economics is done. Yeah. So that was uh, the kind of thing that we were looking at to develop that kind of uh, understanding of what uh, a, a critique of the discipline can do to the discipline and transform it and reimagine it. Right. Centrally, of course, uh, the question of method, through the question of method. Right. Uh, it's an interesting point. So uh, we also wanted to know if you think a criticism of science is also important, particularly in the context of the campaign that you mentioned, the March for Science, and then the recent COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> Rene, you want to go or should I start first? No, you can start. It's fine. Okay. So, um, like Rene said, the genesis of the volume was beginning with conversations on this March for Science. Yeah. So, uh, I think, and I'm sure Rene will agree, that are probably uh, uh, early, uh, at least my early, uh, damning critique of uh, something like the March for Science. Uh, had to go undergo some kind of complex uh, changes. And that is what we talk about in the volume also. That, you know, a, a campaign like the March for Science uh, is problematic for those of us who are doing science criticism and science uh, and technology studies in India. To basic, what are we doing actually? We're basically saying that the hegemony of science in some ways is problematic both to uh, academic disciplines, but also to the larger social uh, context in which in the worlds that we live in. Um, because why? Because it does tend to um, erase uh, so-called non-scientific and unscientific modes of thinking and thought, and thereby it sort of reduces the uh, diversity of the knowledge base of the culture. Yeah, so for people like us, the march of science is deeply problematic in that sense. But having said that, um, it is one of the ways in which, uh, objectively speaking, it's one of the ways that you see a rather apolitical community like the scientific community, which generally does not, uh, uh, you know, is not highly uh, politicized, yeah, is coming out and doing this march of science. So it's fascinating and therefore needs to be supported and endorsed. But I think, for example, um, and, and, and then the kind of criticism that we are actually facing uh, of science today uh, from the uh, global right, from uh, cultural nationalist groups uh, is making us uh, sort of strategically reposition ourselves a little bit. Yeah, and be probably much more uh, uh, empathic towards uh, something like the March of Science. Yeah, uh, but... Uh, you know, during, for example, the COVID-19, yeah, I think we went through ourselves an understanding, at least I did, a deeper understanding of, uh, despite all our observations and ethnographies that we do, in here was a time when we could see the precarity of science and the promise in it, yeah. Uh, I, the, the time that we were all waiting for the vaccine to come, the time when we were waiting for us to understand what is going on. Yeah, there was a fresh engagement with uh, the promise of science and the deep consciousness of its precarity. That is that most of the scientists, and you see statements that I was following of, for example, Gagandhi Khan, most of them were saying that, you know, we are not going to be come up, coming up with explanations and solutions because governments want it. We are not going to be coming, we have to observe the vaccine, we have to work to, you know, looking at it, we have to observe the virus. It's time, yeah. And in that time, we are dealing with precarity all the time. So I think that understanding of science during the pandemic actually changed uh, uh, quite dramatically and to see also how it also reinforced the idea about how the scientific institutions were also deeply involved with, say, uh, the pharmaceutical industries, the larger capitalist structures. Um, so it was a very, very um, 
fascinating time and i think it sort of uh, reinforced some of the some of our earlier theories in uh, science studies about how science as an institution of modernity has produced immense risks in our life worlds yeah and yet uh, we learn eventually to put our trust in science rather than other things yeah in modernity so in that sense it was a very interesting uh, time for us to place this volume to try and look at uh, how we ourselves as scholars of science and technology studies or let's say science science criticism or those who do science criticism and we end the uh, uh, introduction also by saying that we need space to do science criticism yeah like an academic lab work and that space is not being provided in the academia and with the larger polemical world so yeah so that's really what i have to say rene would probably have something more to say yes i mean you know science criticism it's interesting because uh, uh, you know i i go with actually what lettu has uh, you know mentioned once that you know the literary critics still enjoy the status because you know in literature but the science critics don't really get that right because you know the in literary studies and literary criticism the critics are taken very seriously but in science actually no science the science critics are seen as an outsider is always an outsider you can be part of the institution but still you are not an insider for various questions about power etc right so therefore i think it is very important that we continue with this notion of science criticism because if you don't really critically look at the practice of science we can't really critically look at various other practices that are connected to the notion of science and scientific method and uh, in the volume also we discussed in the especially in the introduction right because th the history of science criticism therefore has to be taken very seriously because it goes back to the very history of science itself so you know to come back to actually the uh, question in the sense of how the discipline that we are in sociology right for example uh, you know in continuation with my last uh, response that we don't really take science criticism in the discipline as well seriously so on the one hand we argue that the scientists don't really but that's the same for our own discipline actually as i was just saying that you know it's you can just count the number of courses that we teach in science criticism because uh, science criticism also invites students to criticize the discipline that they study which is sociology and anthropology, which of course, in the tradition of social anthropology, we have right a very reflexive uh, tradition in the social anthropology, but not that much actually in the practice of sociology. So I, uh, you know, kind of agree with, of course. Yeah, you know, and, and if I if I may add, I think our struggle, and I think all four of us would know, and a lot of people in the academia would know that, and even probably in in the outside world. that if we critique science it almost becomes that you are anti science and if yes yeah. <laughs> and if you are anti science then you are anti development you are anti progress you are anti all of the values of modernity which is a thing that requires to be corrected that when you are critiquing science and we are critiquing modernity when you are critiquing the paradigms that come from the enlightenment western enlightenment modern you are critiquing it perhaps as insiders you are critiquing it perhaps in a reflexive manner which should be productive right and um, so in that sense i'm saying that uh, the idea that if you critique science then you are uh, you know you are a baba something like that yeah so uh, uh, that 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 mindset needs to change even amongst the social scientists that our understanding of what who we are and what we are needs to be further nuanced a little bit and also you know i think this idea of the scientific temper which has been sort of used so um, you know unquestioningly that equation between any rational reasonable logical form of thinking is equal to scientific temper that naming has been deeply problematic is what i would say and we need to rethink that and we need to uh, disassociate or delink forms of reason and forms of thought and forms of reflexivity and therefore forms of action uh, uh, from just being anything critical is not science is what we need to understand and we also need to understand that all science is not critical just because the idea of the scientific method is that it is self correcting it is critical it is challenging that was the history of science but the the as a science that was the beginning of science as it progressed 
it did not do that no it became as complicit with other uh, um, uh, other structures of power right so we need to point that out in in the field of science criticism Uh, you know, made, you've made a very important point about how science criticism challenges uh, power. Uh, so, uh, you know, on in your book, you talk about methods. So how do how does a critical look at methods also enter this uh, whole uh, question of challenging uh, power? Maybe if you could throw some light on that. I think like, you know, by studying method, we are, of course, looking at... Uh, uh, the idea of truth. And then we know that, of course, you know, certain sense of sociology and anthropology of the notion of truth. And then, then very clearly we know that the notion of truth has clear, you know, clear connection to the notion of power. So by looking at actually method in whichever ways, whether it is historically or anthropologically, uh, we were in many ways trying to look at the very notion of truth and how this notion of truth has deep connection to this idea of power. So method, truth, and power is therefore, you know, these are the three key terms that you find also in the volume, right? So when we look at actually, therefore, any notions of method in any, any disciplines, be it literature or humanities or, or physical sciences, we're also looking at the idea of how truth production really happens. What is the politics of truth in many ways? So by asking the basic question about the politics of truth, you're talking about, of course, the politics of power itself. And I think I think Aditya uh, Nigam's essay deals with the, uh, this idea also from a post-colonial perspective as to how uh, you know his work on uh, uh, decolonizing uh, theory is an important one. But our invitation to him was to look at the idea of how do we decolonize method, yeah, and how do we look at the question of uh, um, the scientific method as it was implanted across. Uh, uh, disciplines, but uh, with 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 uh, uh, you know spread of the colonial empires and with imperialism, yeah. So uh, and and this is uh, very very important, for example, in literature. And uh, uh, Sharmila's essay also deals with that. So I think it's um, the question of power is probably directly related, no? And in the Foucauldian sense, of the question of knowledge. And it marginalizes. So whether uh, even today, for example, if you know that we know, all of us know that if you are going to talk about sexuality uh, from a feminist perspective, or if you're going to talk, talk about sexuality uh, from a queer perspective, the methods you will use uh, are devalidated before you produce the knowledge. Ki, oh, you know, for example, I face a lot of this in when we are talking to scientists, and I'm sure Rene faces a lot, because when we talk about uh, stories as a method of knowledge production, or when we talk about narratives as a way of, uh, you know, understanding experience, and we don't talk only about numbers, um, then when we go deeper into that, uh, the, the, the knowledge that you gain about, say, the uh, nature of, say, for example, uh, science or the culture of science, uh, the devalidation of that knowledge happens through the devalidation of the method that we use. Yeah, to say, ki, oh, but this is, this is, I mean, this is just an anecdote, this is just a narrative, this is just a story, right? Uh, and it, it is not taken uh, as valid admissible evidence yeah, in, knowledge, in theory production or in knowledge production. So in that sense, I think the question of power is deeply connected to the root of the question of method that we use. And if you devalidate methods, you're devalidating truth claims. Yeah? So in that sense, and we all know how much pressure we are under to use the scientific method to prove anything. Yeah. So that that, that it clearly indicates its uh, linkages to power. And method is also, uh, for example, the academic method. How many people in this country, for example, have an access to that method? Yeah. What happens to the truth claims of those people outside the academic? who do not use this method. Yeah. Right. So the book is, of course, the first of its kind in India or South Asia. And both of you have also mentioned how difficult it has been putting it together. So 
who are the primary readers that you know the book seeks to cater to yeah rituparna that's it's actually an extremely uh, important question you know uh, in this uh, era now of interdisciplinarity yeah that uh, we are entering into uh, can this book be for example a resource for people who in interdisciplinary education yeah and i would say it's not it's not necessary for everybody doing interdisciplinary right so interdisciplinarity by its very logic came from margins uh, whether it's women studies which was interdisciplinary whether it was development studies which was interdisciplinary uh, where you know people were uh, discourses were shifting outside of the disciplines and making different uh, different academic uh, domains uh, so that was one way in which uh, academic discourse stepped out of disciplines and then brought that consciousness as i was saying to the disciplines themselves there was another way that we are expected to do the interdisciplinarity which is like you know get a little bit of here get a little bit of there put it patch it together and yeah you have a interdisciplinary program ready so i would say this this book is uh, not for that audience this book is perhaps aimed at an audience which is uh, seeking to build a conversation across the silos within the academia yeah and for uh, teachers for uh, course designers for researchers for uh, thinkers who want to understand and carve and craft out spaces in their practices of how to do interdisciplinarity and how to deeply understand the question of method and not how to come up with simple answers like idhar se ye le lo idhar se ye le lo interdisciplinary ho okay. gaya yeah so my risk uh, my fear is that it might look like that but frankly i think it uh, is much more aimed at an audience which is uh, trying to do critical uh, interdisciplinary studies or critical science studies yeah so uh, anyone really who wants to in the academia who wants to look at a conversation on method in the disciplines that's really the audience of this book yeah i think yes uh, it's very important so the question is extremely important in many ways actually now firstly the book is not about india not about south asia that is one thing that we we had in mind since the beginning right because you might have noticed that all the contributors are based in the global south they are all from india mostly uh, but then you know um, what they are asking has a deeper connection to the notion of decolonizing methods in many ways so we are not really therefore even in the title you will not find india you see it's you know it's a, uh, uh, mapping method discipline narration but not in india right? so because we had various debates regarding this as well but one of the reason we didn't want this is an india specific volume because of a particular reason because if you look at the very uh, history of or debates on methods we don't really find scholars based in india contributing to these debates it's mostly people from north american european universities they would talk about methods we are only the objects of methods you know the global whatever no south is only the object of method in many ways so and that's one of the, if you feel you know what banu subramaniam has written on the book is actually about that this volume is really contributing to debates on decolonialism and decolonizing methods and uh, and debates on social sciences and humanities actually right so therefore it is of course um, uh, it, i think it is also one of the first attempts not just in india because if you look at the literature on scientific method of course you know we have henry cowell's book on history, history of scientific method but it's not that you have a book where you have contributors coming from all the disciplines and across uh, you know disciplines uh, humanities social sciences natural sciences and all of them are based in the global south talking about disciplines which i think is very important that is one of the important arguments that we are put forwarding in the volume uh, i'm sure gida would uh, agree with that Oh, yeah yeah of course we were very conscious of the fact that we wanted conversations from here but we wanted those conversations to be about uh the nature of knowledge about the nature of uh, uh, the academia so it's as uh, relevant to anybody studying or discussing method anywhere in the world
Right. Uh, so th thank you to uh, Dr. Chadha and Dr. Thomas uh, for, you know, joining us today and sharing, uh, you know, about their book. And also thank you to Professor Sarukai, who's the series editor. Um, and uh, you discussed uh, such important questions about methods, and I'm sure our viewers would take a lot from this discussion. And I'd also suggest them to go pick up the book and definitely go read it. So, yes, thank you so much once again. Yeah, the South Asian edition and uh, the global. So, <laughs> oh, great. Yeah.